So, Tom, thank you so much for joining me on the Teacher Podcast. No worries. Um, so we're at the Lead Learn Langs 2019 yes. event. Um, I am getting on through all these interviews. I'm interviewing so many amazing people. Um, so thank you for agreeing to uh, be on the podcast. My pleasure. We're going to talk about balance, mainly uh, life-work balance, which is something that I am so passionate about. So um, even before we came, it kind of circled you off as one of the people that I wanted to chat to. So Excellent. Thank you so much for yeah, um, my pleasure. having this conversation. Um, one thing that I ask all the guests to do is kind of give a backstory of, you know, how you got to where you are now. Um, so your journey into teaching, um, you know, your journey as a teacher, you know, what it was like, mm -hmm. what you're doing now, just so people know why they should listen to you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so... My mum is a teacher, or mm -hmm. was a teacher, she's now retired, and um, I just some of my earliest memories of my mum is her sitting in the kitchen table with lots of um, paper and rulers and big wooden stencils, mm -hmm. and she would sit there and uh, design these most amazing displays, and I, she just let me help and draw around some and cut some out, and I remember thinking, this, this is a good job, I, I want to <laughs> do this, um, and I think so began my love of education really um and then my sister became a teacher as well so it just kind of it just flowed nicely mm -hmm. now i was determined to be a footballer i was determined to be in a rock band and as much as my mum and dad encouraged that i think they also saw my potential and said maybe we just kind of <laughs> get your degree in teaching but i as soon as i did my very first placement as a 14 year old just helping with garden reading books i, mm -hmm. I loved it um interestingly still to this day i've never used stencils <laughs> uh, as a teacher, which is a real shame. Um, so, but it was a really simple and easy progression mm -hmm. for me to, I knew it was what to do with college, I knew what to do with university, it was, it was mapped out where some of my friends still struggled to find mm -hmm. their purpose, what they wanted to do. So I was quite lucky in that sense. <clears throat> then I've worked in uh, three schools, my last school, St. Bernard's. Um, that changed everything for me really. My Head teacher, uh, Andy Moore, we used to work together in a previous school and his vision, his his drive, his passion is just incredible. You just want to, you want to jump on board mm -hmm. and you want to follow him wherever he goes. <clears throat> uh, so when he started to talk about curriculum in a certain way, assessment, and what teaching means, it was just a natural progression for me to go and follow him to that school mm -hmm. and it opened up so many possibilities and I found myself not just loving teaching, but really falling in love with education as a whole mm -hmm. and seeing the potential where it could be. Um, to the point where I was lucky enough then to work with the likes of Shirley Clark for a year doing action research. Uh, we did the Dylan William project and myself and Andy were the key leaders on that and lecturers. Um, we've worked with Guy Claxton, Becky Carls, and so many great people. And even now there's so many I could mention from uh, Deborah Kidd to Hal Roberts, mm -hmm. who just, they influence you more, they they help you grow that love of learning. And um, we started to realize then when we became a teaching school, it's not the same progression, if you like, from teacher to to assistant to deputy to head. Actually, we can start to go in different directions. We have the resources to do so. And my love of assessment just took off. But at the same time, I could see all the great things that Dylan and Shirley would talk about, it just was not being reflected within the school. It was so data-driven. And that was where the issue came for me. Um, so we decided to do something about it, myself and Andy. Um, and six, seven years later, and a lot of money and investment from family, friends, we've now uh, got a company called Balance. Mm -hmm. Again, we had no intention of starting, but we just couldn't continue seeing brilliant teachers lead the profession. We couldn't continue having the same workload that we had ourselves. We wanted to do something about it. And um, I taught my last lesson in July. Mm -hmm. And I'm so I'm now five weeks out of school. So far, it's okay. I do miss the children, though. Mm -hmm. um, when I speak to some of the staff and they're talking about the staff meetings they had around creativity or learning powers or curriculum, I feel a bit sad that I can't get involved in that side, mm -hmm. but I know now working schools across the country being to events like this, I think I've made the right decision. Well, thank me. you. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay, so you've mentioned that you um, you know have a love for assessment. Where yes. did where did that start? Um, I think it started with a personal story. Um, I went through a really quite tragic time in my life um, in my previous school. My cousin was murdered. Um, we were on the way to watch a football game and I arrived at the pub early as we always do, get the drinks in and he hadn't arrived and the bus came to take us off to the ground and he still hadn't come and when I got in touch with another cousin say, where are you? It was, I don't know, it just really, it all went off and just around the corner he was attacked and he was, uh, he was killed and the attacker turned on his son who was only 14 and it was, it's just a horrible, really horrible time of my life and um, this was in January and we lost a couple of other people through cancer, my auntie's uh, cousin, and it was it just you couldn't script it. It was it was just horrendous. And I remember, I remember going to the intensive care unit to see my cousin. He asked for me to come and see him and stay with him. I did over the weekend, but then I had to be back in school on the Monday, and I just couldn't do it. And I took a couple of days off, and I, and I went back in. And obviously, it was on the national news. It was it was everywhere. It was it was horrendous, and. I'll never forget the class I was teaching. They were a bit of a tough class. Um, the boys didn't really want to show emotion apart from anger, and and they were lovely, lovely children. But it was it was a lively class. And I remember when I came in, they just all went back in school. They all walked in, so silent. And I'll never forget that. And they just looked at me because they all knew <clears throat> they had police were everywhere. It was all cordoned off. It was in the newspapers, as I say, on the national news, and and. I remember trying to do the register and I couldn't even get halfway through the register. It just broke down and just said to my TA, hey, look, I've got to go. I can't do this. <clears throat> um, so I went to the doctor and said, look, can you sign me off for a couple of days? Because I just, I can't cope with this right now. I need to be in intensive care. I need to be with my family, with my mum my and my dad and cousins and whoever else. And we're very close family. Mm-hmm. And he, I remember him saying he would, but... I would be back in the week after asking for more time. So he said he's going to sign me off for three months. And I just, there's no way I could do that. I was a year six teacher. We had sats coming up. There's mm-hmm. not a chance. And he just, i never forget this. He said to me, you're not that special. The school will survive without you. Mm-hmm. And at the time I thought, like, how rude. Like, we forget that though. I am special <laughs> kind yeah. of thing. And But he was right. And the school did survive and everything was fine. And, but I wasn't, mm-hmm. and there was there was so many underlying things that were going on there, and I just went through a spiral. And I remember there was a lot of pressure about being year six year about where's this accountability, the dates, and mm-hmm. and lots of it. It was just a really, really horrendous time in my life. Mm-hmm. I, words don't really do it justice. Um, and I remember one night, it's, just, it's such a silly story. I don't want to think about it. It was. Um, I remember driving home and running out of petrol and it was pitch black and it was raining and I just thought, I've got no money on me. This is just life stinks kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just thought, like, that's enough. I just can't do this no more. The, the pressure and the, I hated going to bed at night wide awake thinking about this and couldn't sleep. And if it did, I would only be for half an hour and then it would, as soon as I'd open my eyes, it would come back to me. I'd, I'd sit up, I'd read, I'd do whatever I could forget about it, how I was feeling. So then I'll close the book and it hit you again. Mm-hmm. And I was fed up with feeling this all the time. Being there for all my family, uh, trips to the hospital, trips around to each other's house, cups mm-hmm. of teas, big hugs. Um, I just couldn't do it. I remember the relationship at the time. I just, I, I couldn't love myself, let alone somebody else, and mm-hmm. that failed. And I remember when I was sitting in the car, just thinking, that's it, I'm done. And what I would plan to do next was just stupid and and horrible. And I don't really talk about this, I'm being honest, so I'm finding it a bit hard. Um, That's okay. Luckily, a um, really good friend, in fact, my head teacher, Andy Moore, just happened to phone just to see how you're doing. And 
that was all he needed. Mm-hmm. And his brother, Phil, was just amazing at the time. And I went round and we spoke and, yeah, to cut a long story short, I stopped doing what I was going to do and that was it. It was like, okay, come on, we can do this. But my answer was, I need to leave teaching. Mm-hmm. That was my answer. I need to get out of this because I can't have this guilt and that guilt. It's just not good for me. I can't continue as a human being. Um, but then I remember thinking, but my case isn't a one-off. This is something that's going on up and down the country. There's nothing special, as the doctor said, about me per se. There's, mm. This is going on all the time. Now, yes, I was... It was mixed in with something that happened in my personal life that was so tragic. But I know people who will leave in education, good teachers, people who I've went to university with who just, they're so disengaged to the job. They hate it now. And I know they are brilliant teachers. They loved it. I think the key thing is, is that, you know, what you're saying is you're talking about a really horrific time in your life. But because teaching is so pressured and such, in some ways, it mirrors it. Yeah. You, you can't. You have to have a perfect life to be able to cope with it properly. Yeah. Um, because of the amount of time and energy and resources it takes, and and it's very difficult when you have to choose one or the other. No, it it was so hard. I mean, I remember before this happened, um, and the girls were the time. Like asking, can we do something tonight? And I remember, I remember saying, I can't, I've got work to do tonight, I'm sorry. He said, well, maybe tomorrow. I said, yeah, let's, let's see. The next day came, I said, what, what should we do? I said, oh, I can't, I've got work to do. Mm-hmm. She was a bit like, I know teachers are busy, but didn't you do that last night? I was like, well, that was last night's work. I've now got tonight's work to do. Yeah. And my biggest fear in life is not living life. I've, I hate the feeling of being trapped. And I, I, that's what I felt like with education. I was trapped to my desk at home, to just marking yeah. books. And there was times when I would take books home to be the best teacher I've ever marked them all on a Friday night and and have maybe better Saturday marking and that's it, then spend evening with friends, Sunday just to relax. And I got to the point where I couldn't even take them out the boot because the thought of even beginning to look at that workload was just yes. too much. Yes. And then the pressure of them book scrutinies and then you were scrutinised at how good of a teacher you are based on the quality of your writing, your feedback, which it, it was just, it was incredible. And that pressure mixed in with everything else going on was just too much to take. But but on a positive from it all, I just thought, that's it. I've, I've got the chance to do something now because it was almost like this. I had a fear at one point. And there's a great quote from Jazan Parfar, which talks about um, the change, I can't remember exactly, but the change will only come once our desire is is more than the fear. Mm-hmm. And I felt from that moment, what could I lose? I, I couldn't be any worse than what I've been through. Yeah. So let's go back to school and I say, look, working with people like Andy, it was a case of, why are we doing this, Andy? And he would tell me the policy reasons, mm-hmm. but then he would agree with me. And he was such a brilliant leader in the fact that we came to about, I'm not going to mark books anymore, but this is what I'm going to do instead. And listen to what Shirley Clark was saying and Dylan Williams, was like, this is all making sense, let's do it, Andy. And he was such a brave leader to say, do it. And if after I come through that door, I'll tell him exactly why I don't like it, don't care, because this is what's right for our teachers and our children. And I look back now and I've got uh, a little boy, um, and I always try and finish my presentation so I love a little picture of him. Mm-hmm. And, sorry. No, it's absolutely fine. He's like the best reminder ever of you just don't let this get on top of you because it's marking a pile of bloody books. Yeah. And it scares me to think that I might not have been here for him. Mm-hmm. To, oh, he's just, he's so funny. He's the best. Love him. I could just eat him on a butty <laughs> and to think that I was ready to pack it all in because of marking books and data it just oh it gets me hungry and I, I laugh about it and I get a bit emotional about it so sorry but um but it's it, real though it, oh it and is you know what frightens me so much about it because obviously we, we're sat here having this conversation we're both a bit emotional now <laughs> and sorry the thing is you know what you said about um that doctor saying that you're not um anything special 
what he meant was you're not different. Yeah. And, you know, you're telling this story, you know, really powerfully now. Um, and I just think it frightens me how many teachers are going to listen to this and hear themselves and hear their own story. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe they wouldn't have taken it to that point. Maybe they're not there. But what you're saying about the enormity of the workload, and I'm thinking, that was me. I, I felt that with the workload, and I know that so many teachers feel that yeah. um, and feel so powerless. And, and that's, that was the thing. I felt powerless. I couldn't... It was... How could I change education after that day? I, I was just a young lad from Birkenhead. I had no chance, but... What I grew from it all was this real kind of, that's it, no more, mm -hmm. no more. Um, so lucky to surround myself, as I say, with those kind of people who could direct my thinking. I was very raw, and but there's, there's nothing more powerful than having that raw emotion to drive you. Mm -hmm. And I just needed that guidance and direction, and, and it came from brilliant people. But I say, I put the picture of Isaac at the end just to remind me and to say to people, look, I just said it upstairs before, and we had a really good giggle about it. What I say is, in terms of balance and the support we offer and culture, is not rocket science. Everyone knows it. But there's a gap between knowing and, and doing. Mm -hmm. Like, I know how to lose weight, and I'm just awful at doing it because I just enjoy food and being mm -hmm. lazy sometimes. Yeah. But I know how to do it. And it's the same with we... I, I spoke then about this is what assessment really is. It's not about data and statistics is actually about just being good at teaching and this is what culture is about and this is what good teaching looks like no one was like wow this is brand new yeah my point is let's close that gap between doing it because we cannot lose any more people i've got family who are just fed up with teaching at the moment who want to leave the pressure put on their kids and husbands and wives it's just Something has to change, yeah. and that's that's kind of what I made stand for. So that picture of Isaac is that brilliant reminder that we will never let this get back on top of me ever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry. Thank <laughs> you. No, absolutely. Very emotional. Sorry Amazing, about that. and um, I think it's really important for people to understand, you know, where this has all come from mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, what exactly is it that you do now? Very good question. Um, <laughs> How long have we got? Well, in the essence, it is a, um, it's just a piece of software. It's, it's a teaching and learning tool that helps people uh, map curriculums. It's, it's all, you can tell I'm not a tech person, but brand new technology. Um, so you're to drag in and drop in. You can really start to work on your curriculum over time. And so you're really happy with it and then help plan out into sequencing the lessons. And what we're trying to do is say, let's put the assessment back into those lessons. Now, that's quite hard because people's mindset and experience of assessment is something that takes a long time. It's a big task to do. And it can be unless, as I say, keep coming back to this unless the culture's right. So we have the software and we can give heads all the lovely bits of data they need, but we say this is not really about that. This is about a tool for teachers to reflect. And part of that we do is looking then at what effective feedback is, getting rid of marking, uh, looking at point in time, assessments and, and feedback to children and then we when we go to schools we say right for this to work we're going to have to take a chunk of your uh, timetable whether it be assembly time staff meeting time wherever it is to let staff stop and reflect on the impact that they've had on those children and that's what assessment truly is it's not about how what they know because children know what they know we don't need to do a test or a teacher assessment find that out it's actually saying what was my impact and there's two points to that one we can then help direct children better next time so directs our uh, teaching but also it helps me grow as a teacher mm -hmm. if we get this right and what we've seen now so many schools who do this who change the culture who ask the right kind of questions they've reduced so much time wasted because they don't see assessment as a task just to do close a book, close the laptop and never look at it again, let the heads analyze data. They see this as a tool to really guide them, to help them become better at their job. Um, mix that in when, as I say, we're getting rid of the feedback, mix it in with how we then we structure things like staff meetings and so on. It's a real big culture tool. At the heart of it is the software. Um, we're seeing people saying 
it's dramatically reduced their workload. It's with tweets saying half four, we're done, school is empty. But yet the planning and assessment is and so on is all a higher quality. So how does it reduce the workload then so that they're obviously leaving earlier? Yeah, so they're leaving earlier. So a couple of things is that we don't expect people to mark now. Now this is we don't just say, look, you don't mark, you do this instead, because we found we tried to do that with our school and everyone's like, yay, no marking. A week later, okay, how do you get on that marking? Oh yeah, we all still marked because there's there's so many reasons. There's an institutionalized mentality about marking mm-hmm. that we've always done it. And if I stop, I'm gonna be seen as a bad teacher. Yeah. Despite what again, what I've said say from 2016 from the Education Endowment Fund, the marked improvement any of the research you want to look at, there's little or no evidence to say it has any impact. But yet we can't give it up. We, it's the knowing, we know this, but actually doing it is different yeah. because of the culture within the school. So we had to attack that part first. And this is why when we go to work with schools, it's not just a case of here's a bit of software, we'll see you in a year's time. It's okay, now let's look at your action plans, let's up, set up bespoke training for you to help you bit by bit change that culture. And it takes years. Mm-hmm. Um, so when they get there, they're not marking, they're given effective feedback. It's not just verbal because there's a difference between the two. It's structured mm-hmm. verbal feedback. Um, so we're having an actual impact. Um, because some people saw this workload challenge and said, saw that data and marking were at the top, so they just stopped doing it. Mm-hmm. And that's the complete opposite end of the dichotomy. You do that, yes, it's great. You all skip out of school at half three, have nothing to do but actually we're not giving the children the right kind of education. And mm-hmm. sooner or later when you do a test, whatever it may be, and you've got 15, 16 children who have failed, we could have picked up a long time ago and we haven't got time out to stop, go back over this because we still need to progress mm-hmm. forward. And what about the ones who do have it? So it's saying whatever we do, we do it in school time. We, have it, we, we talk so much about discipline equals freedom, not discipline in terms of a, a head teacher ready to whack you over the head if you're not doing your assessment, but saying, have the internal discipline to structure your time you have, and we call them huddles and other nice little yeah, jolly words. I understand that because, you know, I also think in school it's really easy for somebody to come over at, at the end of the day when really what you need to be doing is, is finishing your marking so you can leave. Otherwise, yeah. sometimes that's why you end up staying three hours because somebody talks to you for an hour. Oh, I was the worst for it. I used to moment to Andy saying, Andy, I'm working till midnight and so on, but if I was really honest, half free till about quarter to five, I'll go and speak to Steve about the football and music and whatever else. And yeah. and sometimes that's important too, because we work in yeah. such a, it can be very stressful and just non-stop time. We need that adult time. And we're not saying not to have that, but we're saying at certain points in the week, we're not saying do this daily, but at certain points in the week or every other week, we need in school time, not after school, in school time, structure this point for teachers to stop and reflect on their impact. There's nothing more powerful than we can do in a school. Um, so any work they need to in terms of software, they do within nine to half three time. And then some schools use staff meeting time and to almost coach staff about, okay, the kids who got on last week, why was that? What could you have done differently as a teacher? We also ask questions about, didn't go that well this week. Okay, well, how are you feeling? How enthusiastic have you been about teaching this area of the curriculum even? And you'll find your your mood, your feelings have a big impact on, on the children's outcomes. So mm-hmm. it's about then always going back to the teacher, looking after them. Mm-hmm. So mix all that in with then the no marking and point in time. And, and we've got so many techniques to help teachers with that. By quarter to four, they're ready then to think about the planning for the next lesson. So you can start to really fall back in love with teaching again, saying, right, I'm maybe teaching this generic part of the curriculum, but how can I make this brilliant? Or how can I make sure that they really get that key bit of knowledge or skill, mm-hmm. wherever it is? And honestly, we're getting some brilliant stories. People saying half four, they're at home in the pajamas. Yeah. But they've done everything they need to have a better standard. Yeah. And um, sorry, go on. Um, so you say that um, you use the software sort of between nine and half three, um, and it's scheduled. So what? Are schools having to give teachers some time out of lessons or how, yes. how does that work? And now this is the hard part because this is what we call the culture. And now at first, when people hear this, like not a chance, we're too busy. 
there's a, there's a great story about a man chopping down a tree. He's been asked to chop down a whole forest and he's struggling with his chainsaw in the first tree. And um, someone says to him, did you just stop, take some time out, sharpen it up, go back, you'll do it quicker. And his response is, I can't, I'm too busy, I've not got the time. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what we say in education. We know this is the right thing to do, but we keep on saying the gap is we're too busy. We'll carry on doing it badly. Exactly. And sometimes we need those brave heads. And we'll find that the schools, were, were hundreds of schools across the country who have got those heads who say, right, do you know what? Mm. Let's stop. And now what we suggest may not quite work for your school, but the, the essence is there. And they may mm. take on board and say, but we're going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. it, it's having to say block that time out is, is critical. Now you have to look at, well, where did the children go? What happens? Uh, with TAs. There's so many questions, but it's up to school. So ask those right kind of questions and doing it for the right reasons. Um, and we're, I mean, I got some feedback the other week from um, a deputy head and she said, this has made me fall back in love with teaching again. And we could do so many studies and research and so on, but nothing will ever beat that kind of feedback we get. Can you give me an example of how one school might might give that time to teachers? Yeah, so the most common one we see is um, on Friday afternoons, uh, assembly time. So a head or an SL team member would take the children into assembly, maybe mm -hmm. with a TA, um, and they'll say, right, you've got 20 minutes, 25 minutes, go and sit in key stages, in year groups, classes, whatever it may be, and start now to reflect on what you've done. So the tool has everything set up for them. They, they've planned out the year or the term, so they'll open up what we've been doing this week or the last two weeks, and then they will kind of make judgments on the depth of understanding. But as they're doing it, they're talking about, well, why was this? Why do you think that? And sometimes have a piece of work with them, sometimes they don't. <clears throat> but it comes back to that discipline part I was saying. My biggest thing is that we tried to this years ago, and I was the worst one for it. Mm. So we take the children into assembly, and they would say to me, okay, can you... um." Off you go, go and do your preparation time, we used to call it. First thing I'll do is go straight to the staff room and make a cuppa. Mm. I love my cup of teas. And then on the way back, I'd speak to Julie, or one of our admin staff, who's just hilarious and we'd mm -hmm. have a good giggle. And then eventually I'll go into class and right, where's my laptop? And I'll try and find a charge and someone come in and say, are we doing preparation? Yeah, we're doing it. And we go and sit down and eventually think, right, open up my laptop and then the children are coming back in. Yeah. And I'll be the first then to moan to Andy that we're not given time for this and he asked me to do this. Mm. And I had to, first of all, look at myself. Mm. I can't blame always outwards. There's many things in the school kind of culture and policies that can improve, but also what about myself? Mm. And that's what we mean by that discipline and freedom. Um, so it's not straightforward as you can, as you can yeah. kind of hear. Um, but when it works, it truly works. We go back to always talking about the individual, not the average child. Uh, we have big displays that promote conversation constantly in the class. Um, and we had, we had one teacher say to me recently, um, he said, she's working this little girl. And she said to her, Miss, this is the most you've ever spoken to me. And it nearly broke her heart. And she said, I thought I was a good teacher, but I realized the culture in which I was teaching was, I teach, you listen, you work. Mm. But since she's had balance, which we promote that conversation to find out more and more always what the children are doing. Um, she said, it's just made me completely rethink myself as a teacher. So it's not, as I say, not just always schools, it's also about the teachers themselves. Yeah. So do you find that teachers don't really mark the, the books much then? I'd say 95% of them now don't, when we say mark, they don't put written words in. Mm -hmm. and they still give feedback, but they give very effective feedback now instead. A lot of it in the lesson, but using varieties of stacks and crib sheets and post notes and whatever else we've got, yeah. they'll give the rest the following day. Um, it doesn't happen overnight though. I keep trying to stress this, yeah. trying to get people, <laughs> wean them off marking is really difficult to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, how do you change the culture in a school then? Uh, it all comes down to vision. It really does come down to your vision. What What do you stand for? I think there's a great quote, uh, could be wrong, could be Mary Myatt who said this, is about um, your vision 
it needs to be lived, not laminated. Mm-hmm. And so many schools have lovely kind of big signs. In our school, we are this. You walk in, it says in a lovely folder, boxy. We need to live them. And we're finding when, when we go to schools, we the first point of call is to sit down with the head and the SLT and say, what is it you want mm. as a school? Park that there. What is it you want for your staff? And everyone says the same. No one, of course, no one wants the staff to be unhappy, to leave, to leave education. Mm. Um, so we say, okay, well, what does that look like then if you get this right? And we work from there. Um, we understand the culture. Everyone has to be involved in it. Everyone, it can't just be from the heads down. So when we go in, we tell our stories. And there's people who work with me now who were teachers, but the workload got too much and they quit. Mm-hmm. Brilliant teachers. So they will go in and say, I was year six, but however, this happened. I think when teachers hear that, they see, they understand why we're trying to say to do what we do. Um, so the why is really important. And from the why, we then build the, okay, so what would this look like? Uh, and then how are we going to do this? Where we find it difficult with certain schools is that they they have the why. and say, oh, this is brilliant. I w- this is what we want in our school. Mm-hmm. But then they won't put the what and they won't change the ways. They ask the same questions. They work in the same format they did 15 years ago. The DFE have moved on. Ofsted have definitely moved on. But our schools, some of them are still stuck in that way. It's the definition of insanity, isn't it? Doing the same thing yeah. over and over again. And it, it baffles me when I go to certain schools and I think if I'd gone back in time 10 years and then they say it's on balance, hasn't really worked for me. I say it's not so much balance. Forget about the software. It's the culture that's not working. Mm. And that's a difficult part. Yeah, and I guess difficult to deliver that feedback as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so obviously there the might be quite a few teachers who are listening um, who are interested in um, how you know your expertise could help them but obviously they're not in a position to get balance into their school have you got any tips um to kind of help them maybe reduce the workload uh yes definitely um so sorry just trying to think um which one's the best one (laughs) yeah we've got i mean a lot of it is that they need to understand why they're doing what they're doing so some of the first things we say is you need to read certain books so, for instance, Sherry Clark and John Hattie's latest book is brilliant. It's practical, as well as giving the research about why we're saying this. I keep coming back to this why all the time. It's no good just saying to people, stop marking and use this crib sheet or use these post notes or make piles of books, compare. Mm-hmm. They need to understand why they're doing it. So the first thing I'd say is definitely check out any book by Shirley Clark or John Hattie um, and start there. Um, then ask, look at the policy and think, in our school policy, are we focused more on the task of marking and feedback or are we focusing more on the learning and the outcomes from it? And what I mean by that is when we were looking at a book scrutiny years ago, we were checking not so much to see the impact of it and is it making progression, but we were saying, have they done the two stars? Have they done the wish? Have they followed this margin marking policy? And it took, again, a brave leader, Andy, again, to kind of stop and just say, what are we doing? Mm. We're focused on the policy and not actually seeing the impact of does this have any mm. uh, impact, as I say, on, on progression. So definitely go back to your policy and, and really challenge it in, in a positive way. Challenge what it says. Um, run questionnaires with staff and, and get the pulse of the school. Now, it may be quite obvious, uh, but I think having that kind of hard data, if you like, say it's just a wake-up call. Mm. Um and again, go back to the vision. Always start with the vision. Okay, thank you. Um, what What do you think? So this is a question I've been asking myself a lot recently. Um, and I, I personally think there's a difference, but what is the difference between life-work balance and well-being? Um, to me, and I could be really wrong on this, but to me, well-being is about... I think about, it's an opinion, so... Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, well, my opinion then is um, well-being is is how I'm feeling, regardless of the task. And by the task, I mean work, home life, mm. friendship, social media, whatever it may be. It's just generally how am I feeling? Am I feeling happy today? Am I feeling sad, anxious, whatever it may be? The work-life balance is then when we apply that to 
part of our life. So it could be work, it could be home life. Um, even things like I've been off Facebook now for nearly two years and I had to because it was just really getting me down. Mm. Um, I got really sucked into it. everyone's life is so much better than mine. Mm. And um, the best thing I ever did was come off it. But so my well-being wasn't the best and my work-life balance if like wasn't to do with work it was to do with Facebook it was I was on there a lot the mm -hmm. balance wasn't there and instead I now do lots of I go on just see my friends speak to them go yeah. to the pub yeah um so yeah to, so to me it's two separate things it's one is how you feel and one is about managing the tasks at hand yeah no I agree with that um okay so what does success look like in a, in a school then if they found a good balance? Um, people smile, um, yeah. there's happiness. I think you, you, atmosphere, I know it sounds quite cheesy, but you, you will feel a better atmosphere in the school, a lot more positivity. People will be open and up for doing new ways of working, learning, mm -hmm. new strategies, policies. There'll be less negative pushback. I, but I think the biggest one is retention rate. You'll, your teachers will want to work there, will want to stay in this school. And I don't mean just leave that school and work somewhere else, but I mean, it will stop people wanting to leave education full stop. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, I think that's what it, it looks like, success. People want to be a teacher in your school. And, you know, have you had a lot of schools who have had that kind of success? Um, yes, quite a lot. And a lot who are definitely on their journey to getting it. A lot who get to the end of the first year and think, wow, we've learned a lot this year about ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And we're now really excited to move into the second year and we've reduced this and we don't do this no more, we don't do this, but instead we do this, this and this more effectively. Um, yeah. I, I love how you've mentioned, you know, they've moved into the second year because this isn't, it isn't, and do you know what, I think as, as um, a teaching profession, we're guilty of this. We've all had that staff meeting where, right, okay, we're implementing this now, and it's like they just think you can turn it on, and then the next week you turn another um, kind of initiative on. Yeah. Um, but it isn't like that, is it? It's, no. it's a process, and you're always learning about yourself, and you're always going to have to tweak things, and it's, it's even like a scheme of work. You can't just make it and then go, well, this will do us for 10 years. You constantly have to rework mm, it and tweak always. it, and it's always a working document. And it's it's getting our mindset to that actually that's okay. And you know we've worked on ourselves for a year, and we're so much better than we were, but we're still working on it, and we're still yeah. still working through it. And I guess the more people come in and the more people come out, there might be a time where you pick up something that you let go that now works. Yeah, that didn't work before. Of course, I think. Um because what we what we build in terms of software is it's just so good. It's it's so simple. It's it's removed from bands, levels, steps, and all that nonsense. It's just a fantastic tool. Now, people, we're, we're getting a lot of people come from old trackers to come and buy this into this tool, and they some people can go off and run with it and be be happy with it. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think the reason why we've had such brilliant renewal rates and people staying with us now for quite a few years is simply because it's challenged them to think differently about their culture. Mm. It doesn't matter what tool you've got, things won't work if the culture isn't right. We were just talking to a teacher upstairs. It's like a, like a swimming pool. You have the best swimming pool in the world as a tool, but in the, if the teaching's not quite right or the culture, the lessons will still fail. Mm -hmm. An iPad can be the most amazing tool, but if the teaching isn't right, and the lessons will fail again. So um, I'm quite proud that our retention rate is so high and people are now staying with us for years and mm -hmm. people saying, I had one teacher stay in Kent, and sorry, it's a bit of a plug, but she was saying, why would you never, wait, I don't understand why people would not use balance it. Mm -hmm. But she's been through the big change for her school yeah. and balance just supports that change, so it's, it's yeah. brilliant. That's amazing, thank you. Um, okay, so I ask everyone this question, it's a difficult okay. question. But if you could wave a magic wand to solve the life work balance problem for teachers, what, what would you do? Okay, this might be a bit controversial. That's fine. Um, I'd wave a wand over Ofsted, mm -hmm. if that's the right way of using my wand. Um, 
so they turn around and apologize for getting it wrong okay. about assessment and especially feedback and marking. Mm -hmm. They've done great leaps and bounds moving away from what they used to do. But people still won't move forward because there's still that little little bit of fear there. Not a little bit, but there's well, fear, yeah. There's a lot of fear, yeah, but yeah. that just that little bit just stops a person from moving, a leader from moving. But if they turn around under the guise of the wand and said, you know what, everyone, I'm so sorry, National Press Conference, we got this wrong. Mm. We've learned from it, and this is what we say. I think that would change everything. Wow. I like that idea. Um, okay. Sorry. No, Sorry that's okay. <laughs> who, who was your favourite teacher at school and why? A oh, great question. Um, I had a couple. I mean, I had Miss Britton, she was a music teacher and I just, I love music and she, I don't know, she believed in me and she just wanted to always push me to why don't you write some songs? Why don't you, have you ever played the piano? Have you ever done this? And I just, I don't know, I, I loved it. She just understood me mm -hmm. as a person. We connected a lot. And in a different way, a teacher called Mr. Denny, who was a maths teacher, very old school. Um, his classrooms were silent. Um, I think in, in modern world, you kind of say you're a bit more of a direct in, instruction kind of teacher. But it really worked as well because there was a there was a level of of safety in the room that mm -hmm. no one was messing around. You could learn. Yeah. So two ends of the spectrum, but both worked just as good. Yeah, I had yeah. a teacher who I liked like that that nobody liked just because I knew where I stood. I guess. Yeah. Um, and as long as as long as I was good, which I was, then I was fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, two definitely two very different styles, and I think that's a nice really uh, story for all the edu kind of battles on Twitter at the moment but it has to be this way or the other way it doesn't mm -hmm. we're all there to help some things will work some things won't work yeah, yeah yeah you're allowed to be yourself you don't have to be a robot totally yeah. um okay where do you think education needs to go in the next 10 years <laughs> <laughs> um wow I think we need to continue to look at curriculum now, I say that with the caveat of the whole dreaded deep dive kind of conversation mm -hmm. at the moment. I think there's a lot of things that still need to be ironed out there. Uh, but if I just kind of park all that kind of off steady part of the curriculum, it's it's just brilliant. The more creative we can be, the more time we can have to really think about what matters most to our children, what are the key mm -hmm. bits of knowledge and skills they really need. But how can we do this in a real inspiring way? Um, and then have, I think I mentioned before, but give more time, directed time for teachers to mm. stop and think about the impact, yeah. even if it's a full day where they can do any assessments they need, where they can look at any planning they want, but time just to stop and reflect on their impact. Not just a, like we're trying to squeeze a 20 minutes, a half an hour here. I think we need mm -hmm. to give them full 30, 40% of their curriculum. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, of their timetable to yeah. think about what they're doing. And I think only that way, yeah, I think that's the only way we can move forward. Yeah, no, I, I think that's perfect. Um, who's your inspiration within education? So I've got quite a few. Um, okay, so there's people like, uh, I mentioned so many times, Andy Moore, mm -hmm. um, what a leader, what a just, and he's like one of my best mates, just a genuine, brilliant bloke. But his passion and, and his just drive to make education better for every single child is just it's brilliant. Um, I'm really lucky, I think, on Twitter to have joined in with a bit of a group of teachers. Um, a lot of them I work with, like sort of Alan Brown, who with today, just keep challenging you and challenging themselves and asking questions sometimes they don't even have answers for, but I love that kind of, just that cycle of how can we just get better? So there's like, on that there's Alan Brown, Deborah Kidd, Hal Roberts is just, just so funny, but again, just inspiring. Uh, Jazz Ampar Far, she's brilliant too. Um, oh, I could go on forever. Guy Claxton, uh, Shirley Clark, Becky Carlson is just ace as well. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, because there's probably lots of people I've not mentioned. Um, Jamie Pembroke for really challenging the nonsense that is data 
on a national level. Just people, I don't know, there's loads. Sorry, I could go on. No, that's yeah. fine. Thank you. Um, and last question then. What did you want to be when you grew up? As I said at the start, I knew I wanted to be a teacher, but definitely a footballer. Um, or Are you a still holding out for that? I still am, yeah. <laughs> I've just got such a... <laughs> I'm falling <laughs> apart, but I was going to say, Everton, if you're out there listening or watching, um, I'd probably do a better job. No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, musician. I love music. I still do. Um, me and my mate, we still write songs, mess around, guitars. Um, yeah, I think musician, definitely. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank um, you. Great content. I know that teachers are going to go, go away and if they can't implement something in the lessons, then hopefully they're going to have the courage to, to question some, some of the policies yeah. like you've mentioned. and. Um, Maybe talk to leadership. Yeah, no, brilliant. Thank you very much. Cheers.